Hello, everyone. Jennifer Osger here with our Mugs and Hugs along with Heidi Marlinghouse. And our Ryan guest Perlman. today. Oh, I did it. <laughs> That always, no, it's so consistent. I love it. It's hap it happens every single time. So Dr. Brian Perlman, yes. So, you know, we would just like to jump right in. Uh, we like to introduce our guests by asking you a question rather than telling everyone who you are. We like to ask you if people were to look you up on the internet, what would they find? Oh, goodness. Great question, that is. Uh, first of all, it's great to be here today. Thank you both so much. Uh, for inviting me. This is awesome. Uh, you guys do amazing work. Uh, what would they find on me? I mean, they would find someone who I think did their career thing a little bit backwards, right? So often you find people that are therapists first, then they become administrators and, and professors and things of that sort. But they'll find out that like I taught first, I became a principal, did that, and then decided to be a therapist and decided to learn more about mental health and trauma and things. So they'd find out uh, a lot about that. They'd find out that I have two books, one that came out in early May, Maslow Before Bloom, and find out that I came out with the book, Whatever It Takes, uh, a year ago. So it's January, 2019. I think that's what they'd find out about me. Nothing terribly exciting, but a lot of good stuff where the worlds of education and mental health overlap. That's where I live. Well, and I think that's where I discovered you is that you have a wonderful Facebook group of that same name, Maslow Before Bloom, yes? Yes, so I probably should have said that. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have a Facebook group. We started a year ago, September. I think there's almost 6,000 people in Maslow Before Bloom group. Um, also very active um, on Twitter. Uh, here's a little plug for my Twitter. Dr. P underscore uh, principal is where you find me. I've been doing that thing for about two and a half years and through both just had such a great opportunity to meet so many amazing educators, amazing people in mental health and others who are just really committed to helping kids and teens uh, to achieve to their best. So yeah, that's you'll find that too. Excellent. So Heidi, would you like to start us off with the first question? Yeah, so um, Dr. Perlman, I, I, I don't know you that well. Uh, Jennifer was the one who, who brought you to us today. And uh, so listening to all of your endeavors, your past endeavors is fascinating to me. Um, and I love that, I lo actually love the backwards journey that you did. Um, and it makes sense to me because, you know, the more I teach, the more I want to know how to help. Um, so that makes a whole lot of sense. And it makes me also wonder what your proudest moments have been doing your work, you know, and what do you contribute to that success? Interesting. It's, it's really great. Proudest moment. I think that there are probably too many to choose from. Um, I could think of many successes with individual students, with um, educators, you know, as a principal working with a um, lot of proud moments. Um, a lot of proud moments there, just, you know, like I see individual people helping, uh, working with folks, but probably the proudest thing would be, we started a nonprofit a couple of years ago. My wife and I did for years. We thought that we would uh, start a school and then decided for a lot of reasons that we could impact more people by starting a, a nonprofit. It's this distinguished school of mental health and wellness. So it's kind of like piggybacks on the work that I do. I travel all over the country, kind of brought in to keynote an event or lead professional development. And we kind of discussed that that one and done is fine. You know, I certainly work really hard to build empathy, to give people tools, to make them laugh, and also sometimes to make them cry a little bit, make them feel. And kind of we're like, how can we help more people? How can we spread information, particularly those things in the mental health world, in trauma, in things dealing with even suicide, self-care, things that none of us learned in our undergraduate or our principal prep program. They just don't have those things, you know? So probably the, the most proud thing uh, would be starting the nonprofit. Uh, our board is made up of educators and psychiatrists and nurses and doctors and 
teachers and I just a whole, uh, I don't know, variety of different backgrounds coming together, all very laser focused on impacting educators so that they can impact uh, kids and teens. So our board gets three or 400 applications from schools across the country. We usually pick between one and three, one and four, and they get a 12 month uh, type of program where we do a deep dive, that we do a needs assessment, we set some goals, and then we're there to support them. And it's really awesome because two of the schools we work with are in Alaska, which is pretty cool. Uh, Heidi, I know you said that you're in a cold weather place. Alaska's pretty cold too. You get to go up as far north as you can go. Uh, we work with a school in Memphis and a school in Delaware. So really that's probably the most proud thing. We're working to put on a conference this summer in St. Louis, assuming it's safe to travel through the nonprofit and bringing in some really amazing speakers. And, and part of it is trying to set up the kind of conference I would want to go to, and then just being very proud St. Louis and you know, not always having the opportunity to have those in our community, but to do that here at a local university. So that's a very long answer about what I'm most proud of, but I would think it's the nonprofit just being so uh, inspired by the others involved and, and being able to do something very tangible. I guess my last comment is we're on a mission to positively impact 100,000 educators and at least a million kids. And I think at last count, we're somewhere close to 50,000 educators. I suspect we're going to raise that number as we get closer to the goal. So that's what I'm proud of. Wow. I'm hearing, I'm hearing a lot of success from you. And um, I'm hearing that that nonprofit is a really good, you know, jump off point for you to do all the things that you want to do. Uh, so what, what do you, what would you say contributes to that success? Like, um, is it that you're focusing on Maslow's before blooms? Is it, uh, is it th that you're bringing in a variety of people? Um, like what, what do you think it is? Yeah, I think globally the success is just being laser focused. Um, my phone rings every day for a variety of you know, things to speak on or, you know, whatever, any way I can be a resource, I'm glad to do it. But really having forced myself to be very laser focused on a few things, um, I taught math. You know, people say, hey, would you come and consult us on math? That's one of the things that I say no to. As much as I love it, it's not really in our focus area. And, you know, sort of the we don't want to be everything to everybody, right? So he says, well, we're thinking about adopting a new communication arts curriculum. Could you help us with that? Well, the answer in my head is yes, I could probably help you with that. But is that really within our focus area? Is that really in our wheelhouse? Is that where we're laser focused on? So what really helps is just saying, does this, does this fit under the Maslow before bloom? Is this something that we know we can deliver it's tied to our mission, and we know that it's going to be very impactful. If the answer is yes, we'll do it. And if the answer is it's math, well, I'm personally interested in that, you know, we just can't. Um, I have a lot of coals in the fire. I have a lot of things. I'm a therapist. I do the uh, trainings. I run the nonprofit. I teach two graduate classes, and I'm starting to write my third book. I don't complain. I love it. I love doing this. But part of what contributes to the success of these things, having a lot of talent around me and also just working really hard and really just being very focused on a mission and, and wanting to never miss an opportunity and really just trying to do the best that we can. So those ingredients, I think, um, have helped and, and a lot of caffeine along the way helps too. So. <laughs> I think it's great that you have a formula. Um, and I have, I have found that to be true that when you have, you know, you really spend the time to find your mission statement or whatever it is that you believe in and you, you stick with that, then you, you can't lose, right? Like, so as a teacher, I would always look at the mission statement of the school and measure myself against, am I teaching to that mission, right? So yeah, I think that's fantastic. And, and also something hard because growing up, I'm naturally a people pleaser. I like to say yes to everything. I don't like to let folks down. And through my therapy training and kind of practicing what I preach, it's learning to say no and, and no with no value judgment to it. 
you know, no, this unfortunately doesn't fit in the scope of what our work is, but let me help you find someone that can deliver that, right? Um, or does this work? I mean, I've done this. I've learned to say no and learned to be a little smarter with, you know, my time, work smarter, maybe not harder, where I had a week, I remember, is not this summer, the previous one, where every day in a week, seven days, maybe it was six and then a carryover, I was in a different city every day. And that was poor planning on my part. I feel like I gave the best job that I could, but it wasn't taking good care of myself because it was several days to get back to where a healthy place would be. Way too many segments on planes, way too many things. So saying that we want to reach this goal, but understanding it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And we have to pace ourselves. That saying yes to six days or seven days in a row of different things might have been helpful, but that is not something that's sustainable. And we can get to the goal and remain healthy and have good self-care and balance because it's funny, some of those trainings, we're talking about saying no, and we're talking about self-care and good mental health and how that's connected to our physical health. And while I was saying the right words, I personally wasn't really modeling that well. So there are times where it might be no, or it might be, please follow back up with us in February, because there's just not a day. We just cannot fit this in our schedule or telling schools that, you know, me and the board want to say yes to everybody. We will all, yes, we want all these schools. And then logistically, you start spreading that out. It's like, there is no way we're going to give the high quality uh, and, and be impactful by doing 20 schools. We, it was hard for us to say, we're only going to take between one and four schools per year. And that's hard. Being someone who wants to hit this goal and wants to impact people, and it's our life mission, being able to say, I want to be here and upright you know, in years from now to be able to continue doing this, that we have to say no or not now and let's revisit it later. Well, I feel like I've learned so much from you in such a short amount of time. And what I appreciate is that you have this very whole system, this large vision and you, you see it from a high level. And yet you also can really zero in on the minutia of the individual decisions you make to get about those results that, that you want in, in the, the big picture. So that that is a really delicate balance. And I like the way you unpacked that. And I'm always going to be keeping that in mind too, because, you know, as we starting out, um, you know, there's this tendency to want to just like throw everything out there and see what'll stick. And, and, but then to realize, well, which, which relationships is there an alignment with and a synergy that will be, you know, really quality to, to get to get us to, to where where we want to be? So thank you. And I'm wondering, you know, in having that that type of view where you have that laser focus recently over the past couple of weeks, months, what are you most passionate about that that you're laser focused on right now? You know, it seems like um, I'll start by saying. The education world, it's so impressive. So impressive what was done that people were able to turn on a dime and literally across the country, across the world, move remotely. And it wasn't perfect. And you know, there are things they probably, you know, with hindsight, we could adjust and, and maybe next time, or hope there's never a next time, but ways that we would handle this differently, but how quickly systems were able to change and adjust and still be thoughtful of our kids and keep them safe and make sure they're fed and give them some level of value and education, understanding it was going to be different. So being inspired by that, you know, even adjusting, you know, I, I know trainings that, you know, moved to virtual that were supposed to be in person. And maybe the focus was supposed to be on trauma and behaviors like, or mental health and anxiety and being able to talk with the people and say, well, I'll still have that. I think we need to adjust and look at, self-care, self-care for the grown-ups, self-care for the children, self-care for parents and the community and adjusting the message and, and maybe focusing more on anxiety and depression and isolation and even anger and de-escalation and, and doing these things where, you know, for, for, for us, I'm excited about that. I'm excited even as an organization 
I mean, like, I, I mean, it's probably 50 trips that were adjusted. And with our nonprofit, I'm physically not able to get to many of them, moving them to virtual with the, we're going to push off the travel until it's safe to do so. And, and just having the, the ability to put our mind together and really, you know, adjust things and still be impactful and still be there as a resource for the different schools that we're working with and, and just saying that we're here. I know we were supposed to be there. We're going to do a remote. We'll do something in the future, but I'm still here. That's not something that, that I will skimp on. Somebody that they're my BFF. If we've done a training together or if we're working through the nonprofit, we're BFFs, which I don't even know if anyone says that anymore. We're together forever. We're there. So reach out, you know, uh, text me, call me, email, whatever, and let's adjust and let's do what we can and be as impactful. That's what makes me proud. It makes me proud that the board is supporting ideas that we have and, and ideas of adjusting how we're doing it. An idea of, of doing a conference in July, this upcoming July, and being supportive about putting together an amazing uh, a group of, of speakers and a location all but still having built into it that we're gonna be making a decision in May, whether we move remote or whether we postpone and we've already baked that in. So just being proud that in a challenging time and an uncertain time and a hopefully once in a hundred years or more time that we were even able to adjust and still be able to serve the people uh, that we wanna serve and still be here as an important resource in the community. I, I love to plan for the unexpected and I pride myself on analyzing things. I'll tell you what, I wasn't ready for COVID. I really didn't even know what a COVID was before December or January. So understanding that literally could have been hunkering down and shutting everything, but making a real conscious decision that we're here, we're available to help. And if it means retooling and changing and you know, even digging deeper and even asking organizations, this is what we normally do, what is it going on in your community or in your state or with your organization? How can we adjust what we're doing to best help you and be most impactful? That's what I'm really proud of. Um, and, and just having opportunities to, to push ourselves and step out of our own comfort zones um, and explore different things. And sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's a work in progress. And that's how we grow and learn and serve people. So that's what I'm most proud of. Well, and as I'm hearing you talk about all of that, I, I heard lots of flexibility, lots of adjustment, um, lots of resilience, and really you're applying the skills that you are teaching. So I just find that really, um, you know, the, the usefulness, you are the example, you are the model for, for those skills that you are empowering other people to have. And I think it, it, you've hit it, the nail on the head. In this role of, of doing professional development or as a nonprofit supporting, as an educator, as a, as a therapist, so often it's like, we're part of the journey too. We're learning and we're exploring and we're, we're doing it both ways. I, as a teacher, I taught fifth grade. I truly feel like I was as much a facilitator and a learner as I was of a teacher. And I think that, you know, I'm a, from generations of teachers, that's my upbringing, my, my people in my family are, are mostly all educators, that it's having that and, and making sure that we're always learning and at the cutting edge and trying to do that. So, and as a therapist role, like we have to practice what we preach. It's so much more impactful. It's so much more genuine when someone knows that, that guy probably has been through something similar and it's not just saying, you know, I'm talking the talk, I'm also walking the walk. So I totally agree with you. I think that that really is uh, an important part of this. Yeah, and Brian, I mean, the more you, you talk about Thank your you. past and your experience, I'm seeing that we have a lot in common. My parents are both teachers. And so I grew up around educators. All my parents' friends were educators. My, my friends' parents were educators. Um, so yeah, that, that's really interesting. Um, and I also heard you just talk a lot about, like Jen said, like pivoting, right? And, and making these adjustments. And I know that as a teacher, you're constantly doing that. I also taught fifth grade. Um, 
and yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's a fun age group, right? I, t I taught most of my career was in uh, the upper grade for elementary, so fourth, fourth, fifth. Um, but anyway, you're always you're always shifting and pivoting as a teacher. You have to because you make these lesson plans and it never goes the way you think it's going to. And you know, like the fire alarm goes off and you have to <laughs> take everybody out, you know, to the field for 20 minutes and there goes your lesson or who knows, right? Some kid has a meltdown. I mean, it's always something. Printer, um, printer's yeah. not working. Yeah, the internet goes out. We're we're really good as teachers at learning how to to make those pivots. And so, if that's what you're passionate about, because that's what I heard you say, is really uh, this adjustment that people are making during COVID. I feel like you probably had that beforehand um, at just being a teacher. How did you, how did this journey begin for you in learning how to make those pivots and learning how to find the tools and the resilience to do that? Uh, that allowed you then to share it with others? Yeah, I think that it, it probably, if we do have a lot in common, probably a lot had to do with our time um, as teachers. That really, that certainly was the place. And, and you know, I started teaching before uh, smart boards and, and, and a lot of the other technology. It's kind of caveman, caveman time. Uh, but, um, you know, you never know. It's like literally trying to prepare for the, you know, unexpected and you just learn it. You just adjust to it and you just embrace it, right? I can get really upset and shut down because of things that are outside of my control. The power goes off. Like you said, the, the fire alarm goes off. A kid has a meltdown. Uh, I was in a building where there was a fire. I mean, it happens. You go outside, it's 12 degrees outside, you know, just, just learning to be okay with that, learning to focus our energies on what's within our control. Um, you know, I, I, I was a tournament tennis player when I was younger, I played hockey, did other sports. And it's kind of like you prepare for everything you can prepare for. And then part of it is you, you got to play the game and a variable changes, you have to adjust to it, right? So, so maybe part of sports uh, had a part to do with that. I was a, a coach growing up, a, a camp counselor, you're always preparing for the unexpected, right? You've got a great day outside and we're going to be out on the lake and, and this, and you have a, a tornado come through or close by. So I think that helped a lot as I was further in my career, you know, becoming a school principal, everything, my best laid plans for the day never happened. It never happened. I, you know, you have a framework of, I want to accomplish these things. So you get in two hours early so you can accomplish most of them and you stay late, but the day happens. And no matter what was on your plans for the day, you get kitty lopes from the building and giddy up, you have to go chase them down and make sure they're safe or somebody destroys a room or you know, uh, two teachers get sick and have to leave and you put back on that teacher's hat. And I taught fifth grade, sometimes I taught kindergarten, sometimes I taught preschool and you know, you just have to be flexible that way and, 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 and a lot has changed, you know? Uh, I, was, I was actually, when the, the beginning phases of shutting things down for COVID, I was actually in a hotel in Arkansas, right? Getting ready for a training. And my wife reaching out and saying, you know, for our practice, I don't even know how much Lysol we have or how many uh, wipes we have and hand sanitizer. How are we supposed to be open if we don't have these things? So like before training, I'm running to Lowe's and I'm running to Walmart and stopping at convenience store, trying to find anything. You just adjust to it and then making plans of, you know, as a practice, we're going to go remote for a while now and making those plans. And I've been using Zoom forever, but training others in the practice and setting up enough accounts so everybody has one. Uh, you just adjust to things, you know, I was doing a training, a keynote address. And right before me, the power went out in the entire building. Okay, well, uh, I'm here. What's the plan? We're going to get it back up. We're pushing everyone back a few hours, making adjustments, changing the flight thing, changing. Maybe I need to stay over another night. You know, you get iced in. I got iced in in Boston from a training. It's my hometown, you know, where I'm from originally. And you just have to. And you have to have that. You can be mad. You can get really stressed about things outside of our control or you just have to focus on what's in our control and what's one positive thing we can do and, and just learn to embrace the uncertainty. And 
If you can do that, you'll be really successful. If you don't, you may have to come see me because your anxiety is going to be through the roof. So yeah, I think that's the best way. I think teacher prep did it for me. I think also learning that, you know, like if we're going to get all upset about what's out of our control, does that change it? Like all it does is make it worse, right? Like that, that was one of my totally. experiences in life. So that's, that's helped me to work on resilience and being able to shift. Mm. Totally. Yeah. I, I, I would tend to get worked up over things. And then, um, my husband finally said to me sometime, you know, it's like, you're looking at a burning building and going, Oh my gosh, the or you can stay calm either way. The, the building's burning. What are you going to do though? You know? And so when he said that it finally clicked, but man, it took me a long time, <laughs> long time to get there. Um, so in learning so much from you, just in these, you know, a couple of moments that we've been together so far, um, you know, your passion, your vision, your tactical strategies that you have, you know, I mean, so, so much there. And, you know, we're not even scratching the surface of surface of SEL. It's just, you know, who you are and how you operate your mindset. And I'm wondering if you had the opportunity to, you're in an elevator. Okay. Imagine that we're going to play a little game. You you're in an elevator. It's going all the way up to the top floor. So you have a couple of minutes and just before it goes up, some the, the doors open up and you get to have a ride with someone. And so you get to have a conversation with them. And, you know, something that's really important to you, something that you could um, really gift them some wisdom. What would you like to say to the person and who would that person be in that elevator ride? Wow, that's really, really hard. Um, hmm. I'll start with the wisdom first and I'm going to stall and figure out who the person's going to be. Um, you know, I think that I would probably share a lot of what we've already been talking about now, um, really thinking about some tools that universal, like tools for just being successful, you know, happy and healthy. And that starts in my opinion with the mental health the mental health and physical health are so interconnected and just talking about, you know, just different strategies that we can use. One we just talked about is focusing on things within your control, um, really trying to notice in ourselves the negative thoughts that come in our head. Everyone has them, right? That cause anxiety. Everyone has anxiety a little bit, right? And really just trying to help them identify and give some strategies to spend a day recognizing how many negative thoughts come in your head. Step two, there's probably 11, give or take 11 or 12 common categories, right? Groupings of these types of negative thoughts. Some are like fortune telling, like what if, what if, what if that happens, right? Black and white thinking, minimization, you know, magnification. I might've said black and white thinking, but there's like 11 or 12 of these things and helping someone you want to be less anxious, you want to be happier, you want to be healthier. First way is to identify how many of these negative thoughts you're having in a day. Next step is labeling them, figure out where your clusters are, because everyone has a few that we do all the time. Uh, like mental filter is a good one. Mental filter is the idea that, you know, one tiny negative thing happens, you might have had the best day ever and one negative, worst day ever, life sucks, everything's terrible. Right. I use the example. I took my grandmother to the art museum before she passed away. My favorite painting is Monet's Water Lilies. I'm literally having a religious moment in front of this thing. Like angels are singing to me. Oh, I'm taking this thing in. And I look over at my grandmother expecting she's sharing this moment and she's pointing at the bottom corner. There's a, a little piece of paint that chipped off over there. That's mental filter. Are you kidding me? Look at how amazing this is. Do we want to take in the beauty of this thing, which is our day, our lives, or do we want to harp on the one tiny little negative thing that doesn't matter anyway? So in my mind, it would be teaching folks to recognize how many negative thoughts you're having, which is the source of so much anxiety and depression, labeling them, and then using fact, logic, et cetera, to challenge those things. Eventually it becomes like muscle memory, like reflex. It'll just pass right through. 
But when we're isolated, when we're stressed, when we're bored and depressed, we just accept that stuff as fact. Okay, and we're not doing that anymore. We're gonna stop that. So I would probably talk a lot about that. I would talk about our window of tolerance that we all have. And you know, some people might we might encounter are one step away from a crisis all the time, one step away from this big emotion. And when you're experiencing that big emotion, you're no longer able to reason and critically think and problem solve. So I work with people on trying to keep that window open doing different strategies of, of breathing and relaxation and doing that so that we're staying in our optimal way. We're staying with that window of tolerance. Wide open is like being at the beach or going to a concert, in my case, with my daughter. Life is great then. So really, I think just in that, this is a long elevator, right? So I'm given a lot of information. Really just, it's, it's some of the keys to, to just being happier, being less anxious, being in a more positive frame of mind. And, and if we do this, even if we just take one small step forward, we're 1% better a day, it's not going to take long before we just naturally are happier, more positive, more able to focus on things and work through things. When we hit that crisis mode or that window slams shut, it's why people have road rage. We're welcoming that adrenaline into our system. And adrenaline's great when I visit Alaska because there are bears there. I like having adrenaline because I'm running from that bear. I don't want to get chewed up, right? We, everything gets just to survival mode. That's great when you're running from a bear. I don't even know if you're supposed to run from a bear, act dead, or I don't really know, but I'm running. It'll help you to survive that. But like when you're in the classroom and you're feeling that same fight, flight, or freeze, it's not a good feeling. It's not a good feeling to feel it come up through your body. You start feeling you're becoming the Incredible Hulk. Nobody likes to feel that way. So that elevator ride would just be about, you know, probably just staying chill and staying calm. So I bought enough time. I want to go on an elevator ride with uh, Abraham Maslow and Benjamin Bloom. They inspired a lot of the work that I do. I love the phrase Maslow before Bloom. So I'm cheating a little bit. I want my, my pal Abe and Benny on either side and just have a really nice talk with them about what inspired you know, uh, hierarchy of needs and taxonomy. Whew. That was a tough question. I was going to buy as much time as I could, but I did think I figured that one out. Yeah, Brian, I'm I'm really uh, kind of taken back. Our subscribers have heard this before, and I know Jen's heard it a thousand times from me. But everything you just described is why I became a teacher, right? I struggled in my youth with my own emotions and uh, depression and all sorts of things because I didn't have the knowledge. I didn't have the knowledge about my brain and that my brain is actually just doing human things, right? Like this is how, I'm how we're all designed and I'm not any different than anybody else in that sense. Um, I didn't have the tools to deal with it. Right. I didn't understand the um, anthropology behind it or the biology behind it. I didn't understand any of that. So I, I went on a personal journey starting in my early 20s to kind of figure all that out. And that's how I became resilient and started healing and accepting of myself. And so I really wanted to bring that to students. I mean, why not? Why not have them be taught those skill sets instead of having to go through the trauma and the drama that I went through to figure it out because not everybody gets through it either. You know, some of them turn to drugs and alcohol or some of them turn to anything else that is, you know, uh, self-defeating. So, um, so yeah, so that's why I, that's why I became a teacher, not, not to teach academics, but to teach those kinds of skills and academics was a vehicle for me to get there. Um, it's so, so important what you just said in, in, in part of the work, and I, it's designed for the kids I serve, but also grownups and families. I have a sheet I work through about recognizing signs of anger in yourself. Your body does a great job telling you things. We are terrible at picking up on them, okay? Uh, it, it, I mean, just things like you can just literally, so I ask people, do, do you start feeling hot? Oh yeah, I do. Does your heart start racing? Is your breathing more shallow? Do you start clenching your fists? And how could we expect kids to be able to regulate or be able to cope and deal when we've never taught them. Like we haven't growing up, my dad, my parents are amazing, 
But my dad's response to anything in the mental health world would have been, go ahead and just tuck that down in your belly. That's what we've done for 12 generations. Or, hey, kid, throw some dirt on it. Get on back out there again, right? Neither of those are great approaches. In fact, they're terrible ideas, right? But how would you know different? So it's really explicitly teaching these things that are such incredible life skills. Maslow before Bloom, basic human needs first. Doesn't mean, I had some guys say to me, so what are we all gonna just sit around and sing Kumbaya and talk about each of our puppies <laughs> dying? So maybe by January, we can have some academics. And I thought that was the stupidest thing I ever heard. I said, I never said that. We are in the academics business. The teaching and learning have to keep going. But if someone's hungry, if someone's tired, if someone is scared, we really address those things first, right? Give the kids something to eat. Let them to take a nap if they need it. Help them de-escalate, process, feel more safe, have that connection. The learning is going to go sky high. We yeah. literally have the ability to help change someone's life trajectory and maybe even save a life. It's so true and it's so valid. What you said is exactly right. And I know your kids, the students you served, we're better for it, right? I've had people say to me, I can't fit it in. Or where's the binder? Can I get the binder? Don't you have the little thing? Can't I just make a copy? So like every third week in January, that's when we do the SEL and I can check it off and we don't have to do it again. That's the, the worst approach ever, okay? And so yes, if we have to sing Kumbaya and yes, if we have to hear about someone's puppy passing away and yes, if we have to process through someone's emotions, not only are we going to help them be successful now, we're going to help them be successful in life and learn that grit and that determination and that perseverance and love and empathy, kindness and compassion. That's more important than history and spelling and math computation. It's critically important things, right? I don't remember much about high school. Like the most important thing I think was typing class because now I can type on the computer real well, okay? But it's that relationship. It's that one teacher, and I can remember Mrs. Rivers right now, who saw in me something that I didn't see in me and helped me see this is the right path and here's the step you can take to get there when I didn't think that that was even possible. At 16, if I could have dropped out, I would have, okay? My dad's like, you're not dropping out because if you do, I'm throwing you out and you're gonna go work on the road crew. And neither one of those sounded very good. So I stuck with it anyway. And it was someone like that teacher, all of us has it, that maybe didn't even realize how they were teaching SEL, how they were building hope and helping you see that potential. And that's what we're paid for. That's what our calling and our passion is. It's not how many words we can get kids to get right on a spelling test or how well they're gonna perform on the high stakes test. It's, it's what life skills we're teaching them so that when it's their turn to fly, they soar instead of crashing. I totally agree with you. You had so many nuggets in there and I know we're running out of time. So I wanna, I wanna make it quick. And Jen, I see that you wanna, I wanna go in there too. Go ahead. I just wanna say one thing is, is you know, I was having a conversation with an administrator about this and, and what you just said, I think confirms it is, I think some people get nervous because it's very qualitative. And mm -hmm. schools like the quantitative data, you know, how many problems did you get right? What's your score? How can we increase enrollment in AP classes by 10%? Because then you can, you can see that number. But my, my thing is, if we focus on the qualitative, the quantitative will, will follow. It may not happen overnight, but, and it, doesn't, it, it takes a while to build that type of culture that you're talking about. But once that culture is in place, and those relationships have been established and trust has been formed, then I, I think that, and I believe, and you know, I'm sure in your research, you, know, you can say absolutely that the numbers will, will then be what you want. No doubt. Here's the thing. I remember as a principal, I said, I don't care about the math test. And people thought I was nuts because I had colleagues that were hyper-focused and literally shut down you know, in March and all we did the rest was test prep. And the evidence says that's the worst thing you can do anyway, because you might, you might game the test this year, but you're gonna see the results of that down the road because we're either missing foundational pieces or you're not teaching a love and a passion for learning. 
I tie in the SEL stuff just as important in that mix. If someone is confident, if someone feels safe, if someone feels like they have the hope and they can make it and they have the dream and they know how to get there, that's the best thing. And the scores are going to be there anyway. If you have the we tat with bell to bell and we're always going to be and going to the bathroom, we're still going to be quizzing you on stuff and you're making education not very positive and, and it's not something where we're taking the time to, to check on people, right? To see how they are, the qualitative pieces, you're not gonna get the results anyway, right? I, I, I had someone say to me, um, I love what you're saying, but where's the data? And I'm like, I have plenty of data where I can to totally show you, I can quantify anything. I mean, I'm a math-minded person. I'm a quantitative person in a qualitative zone. You can do both. I've learned to walk and chew gum at the same time. It is possible to do that. And it doesn't mean that we're going to say, okay, so here's our SEL block, or we're going to have an SEL day of the week. I don't think you need to do that. I think it could be far more organic and have some ideas and some things we're infusing and then addressing them as they, as they come and having sort of a culture of this uh, is the most successful way. I, I do struggle. There are a lot of people in our field that are very linear, that are very, this is how it is and this is it, and I need a binder, I need to tuck it under my elbow. Where's the binder? I need a binder. And, and it's fine, it's so fine to have you know, some tool, but it's so much more powerful and impactful when it's authentic, when we can apply it in the moment, when something's going on here, and, and, and do that and be that uh, for someone. I, I think that I used to say, my wife's been a therapist for 20 some odd years. I'm newer to this, this piece. I was an educator and we used to have these conversations, her mental health world, my education, there were these two silos. And like over the last 10 or 15 years, it started being, she'd start talking about 504s and IEPs and what's going on in the schools. And I would say anxiety, depression, oppositional, what's going on, it's like, like the caveman in me, like, oh, these things are similar. There's overlap. Our work is similar. We should be marrying these concepts and be providing that, you know, we as teachers can talk to the therapy world about what's going on in our building. And we as therapists can talk to teachers about what we're seeing. And it shouldn't have to be such, you know, separated concepts that they really do need to be overlapped. But that really isn't just dealing with the folks right now. It's going back, ask a teacher how many classes they've had in this kind of material. They'll tell you child or adolescent psych or ed psych of the exceptional, whatever the heck that means, right? There's no trauma. We're not teaching about anxiety and depression. We're not teaching explicitly about SEL. That's not one university, that's the entire country. I spent a year rewriting curriculum that I'm teaching now at a local university that's infusing trauma behaviors, problem solving in these areas, and building hope, and these sorts of things that we just, we've been great at teaching math, and teaching science, and teaching language arts. I, I took a class on teaching music in the elementary school. I suck at music. I never taught music. I would have rather used that. I love the arts. They're really, really important, but for a gen ed fifth grade teacher, I needed that other class. I needed the, the helping deal with a crisis with a kid class more than teaching music or teaching art or teaching PE. I knew I was never going to teach any of those. Very important, great content, love those, very necessary, but where's the SEL? Where's the mental health? Where's the trauma? Where's any of those pieces? I feel like we're getting better at it. We're kind of doing the trainings, top down, catching people in the field, and we're starting to see more within the colleges. So soon it's not just a binder. It's not just that one class, it's infused in, in everything that we do. So you actually, if we, and we just have real short now, but you actually tied into exactly what I was gonna ask you next. And, and a lot of what you said earlier about, you know, they want the binder or, the, or just the lesson, you know, for me, I had to learn mindfulness for myself first and I had to learn it out of a binder or a curriculum or lessons, right? But then I, 
had to use it in my personal life. And people questioned me when I started teaching it. People talked to me about the whole kumbaya thing. You know, I was approached that way. And um, for me, it's more like, no, no, this is just what I embody. And so as I'm teaching math, as I'm te teaching lit, as I'm teaching history, this comes out, right? So it's not just like you said, every two weeks or that, you know, half an hour a day kind of thing. It's it's constant and it's alongside the academic. They're not separate. They're all enmeshed in one. Um, and so I'm hearing you say that, you know, that's starting to be taught more in the colleges, which then is being brought into the schools. What more can we do to bring this part of education into our school system so that it's not such a slow trickle effect that we're having right now. And it is more mainstreamed within all of the academics and everything that we teach students already. So you've given me the greatest challenge today because we have one minute left and I'm gonna give you a semester course in a minute, okay? So, so um, my belief with this is we have to start small. We have to build success. We have to get people who are comfortable with this confident with it, when those things occur, when people see the positive results, more start to jump in and want to be a part of it. So, and, and it's making it approachable and it's not setting the goal that you have to have a PhD in some mental health thing to be successful. We're setting the bar too high, change is scary and, and, and it, make it afraid, make it something that they're out of their comfort zone. They're out of their window of tolerance. So they're not going to be successful. So it's starting small and helping hold hand, holding hands and scaffolding our way through it. If we do that, and if there's successful models, everybody's gonna to wanna to be a part of it. We start somewhere, start small and work our way up. Eventually, it's not gonna be this independent thing. As you said too, it's just infused in everything that we do. That's what I would recommend. I love that. And I wanna just say, I think in starting small, it starts with the, the administration at one school. I don't think starting small is with the teacher because I've tried that and it didn't work because I wasn't supported. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's just too much pressure for others to do whatever the administration is requiring. So I think if we start small by changing the minds or not even changing the minds, but um, educating and enlightening the administrators so that they can support their staff who often already know how important this is. Well, exactly. Thank you so much. We, we know you have to go. We normally ask you, what questions do you have for us? But what we can do is you could, we're gonna give you the recording to this. You can maybe, if you feel so inspired to put it on and here's another plug for your Maslow before Bloom for your Facebook. And maybe you could ask us the question on the Facebook and maybe Heidi and I could answer it there. I would love that. Thank you so much. And just like an educator and just like a therapist, Everything's stacked up and yeah, I'm gonna run because I've got a therapy client ready to go. It has Thank been you. amazing. Thanks you guys so much for All having right. me. Thanks for being with us we today. Can have a conversation later. All right, bye guys. Thank bye. you. Bye. I think I got the print screen. <laughs>